For the sake of time, if you would open up your Bibles, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you know, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from those things which you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. This morning, my message is entitled, Free to be a Slave. I want to let that sit in, and, and, I, and I recognize that I may say some things which initially may trigger some people. Uh, I'll use that word. It drives me insane, right? And we live in a culture of outrage where when somebody says something that sounds off, before they can even process through, they're already so outraged that they can't even listen through to the rest of the message, Right? And, and, and I, I, wanna be, I, I, I want you to be recognized that that is some part of our culture. And, and I want you to recognize that because of that, it, the, the tendency is for us to hear those words through cultural settings and through histories and cause us to maybe shut down. Can I ask that you listen to me today without preconceived notions? Yes? Oh, whew. Good, because he was like, yeah, no, Pastor Mike, you're done. <laughs> See, here's the interesting thing. We live in a culture which is all about individuality, right? We're taught, you know, you're special. You're the only one. There's no one else like you. You're, you're, you know, you, you, you only you can do what you can do. And, 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 and there's this idea that everyone is valuable. Now, how many of you would agree with that statement? I hope more people would agree with that statement because that's scriptural. God created us with value. God created us in a way that was amazing. And we recognize that sin corrupts, right? When we make decisions that push us away from God, we become corrupted. We lose our sense of identity and our sense of value. And, and so today I want to take back one piece of our identity, but it's this thing that is a little bit disturbing when I tell you one of the identities you have as a believer is you are a slave. Now that's kind of crazy because Scripture says you're no longer slaves but sons. Anybody ever read that? Yeah, it's there. You're no longer slaves but sons. So how do we negotiate? Well, wait a minute. Does that mean that there's something wrong in the Bible? There's something off in the Bible? And my answer to you is no. It's the understanding that we have been freed from the slavery to sin, but just as Paul has said, we've now become slaves to righteousness, which changes the whole ballgame altogether. But let's put things in order. You see, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Marco started when he talked a mess, brought a message, and he said, let your last word be love. And I pondered this message, and I pondered this message because, first of all, you know, it's something that I study all the time. I, I, you know, I'm challenged by. Love is a, is a challenging thing for me. Let me just tell you something. If a message about love is easy, it's the wrong message. Let me just say it again. If a message about love is easy, it's the wrong message. If you think it's easy to love the way God loves, you got a problem with what you think love is. You see, the love that God talks about is an agape love. 
And the love we think about are something else. There's, there's eros, there's the sensual love. There's, there's, there's phileo, there's the brotherly love. There's storge, which is this familial love. But you know what's interesting about those loves compared to agape? If you think about them, they're all about how I feel about what I get. Right? But agape love, what God has called us to love, the unconditional love, is not anything about what I get. It's all about what I give. And by the way, Jesus gave agape love, unconditional love, not because we loved him first, but because the scripture said he first loved us. You know why that's important? Because if salvation and relationship with God ever depended on us finally getting around to feeling good about God, likely many people would never have a relationship with God. But God meets us in the places where we're most broken and he begins to change us from the inside. How many people have ever can look back in your life and you go, man, do I ever remember what life was like before Jesus? Amen. Just a couple people. <laughs> Some people don't. You know why? Here's, here's an interesting thing. Some people have grown up in the church and so they've taken for granted the relationship with God. Sometimes it's not a bad thing. Sometimes that's the most beautiful testimony, right? They've been raised in the Lord and they've never wandered from the Lord. That's a beautiful thing. But I was talking to the people on Wednesday night and sometimes our religion has become a ritual. Now rituals in and of themselves aren't bad unless you lose the meaning behind it. And some people, I was talking with a family last night, we were at an event last night, and what a wonderful family, uh, but the, the gentleman was trying to, we were, we were having a conversation about theology, and this was, uh, was at a, a birthday party for a friend, and, and we were talking about theology, and, and, and he, he was explaining to me his relationship with God and, as, as, you know, through, through the lens of Catholicism, it was just a wonderful conversation, clearly loves the Lord, clearly, you know, questioning, but he goes, you know, um, somebody once said to me, uh, you, you can't be, what do you say, you, 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 going to church does not make you a, a, a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. I said, yes, that's absolutely right. And he said, so I don't really go to church very often because that's not really how I define my relationship with God. And I said, you know, I understand that, but, but there's a problem with that. Right? Because at the same time, God calls us to be a part of the body of Christ. And we don't get to be a part of the body of Christ by being alone. But it's a lot easier to be alone because if I'm alone, I don't have to love anybody else because I'm too busy loving myself. You see where suddenly a message about love isn't as easy. Why? Because to be a Christian, yeah, I, I, I have to come to church. But coming to church doesn't make me a Christian. Coming to church gives me the opportunity to grow as a Christian. Why? Not just because I hear another sermon that I go home and go, that was a good sermon. Ooh, I'd like another one like that. Or, ooh, you know what? There was a better sermon I heard another day. It's because I take the word of God that I heard and I begin to put it in practice in my life. Why? Because when I begin to do that, what does it do? It begins to change me. But change me from what to what? Bishop then follows it up with this message, which I hope you've listened to it more than once. And if you haven't heard it, right, it was on the divine balance. And it was the recognition of this understanding that, that we, we need both the power and presence of God, but, but at the same time, there needs to be a structure in order. And a gentleman I heard one time, uh, Bishop Randolph Sly said, the problem with the church is this. The church with all the power has lost its symbols, its structure. And the church with all of its structure has lost its power. You have to have both in order for the church of Christ to stand. We have to have both the grounding and the framework of structure, but we also have to have power. But we understand then that there's something about structure and order. And Bishop made this statement. He said this, and I pondered this. He said the biggest hindrance to experiencing the power and presence of God is not wine and pornography. It is disobedience. And it's from that word that launched me into this thing. Pondering. What is it that keeps the church from growing? And when I say that, I, I say that as the church broadly. And as I thought about it, it's because we don't like the word obedience. Because what does obedience mean? 
Obedience means not my will, but my commander's will, my boss's will, my whatever, be done. And so we look at this and we say, okay, so I, I want to see the power of God, but yet we, we, we also want to negotiate with God how we're going to live, how we're going to connect with him. And so as I pondered this even further, Pastor Marco then brought Galatians out last week and he began to talk about this concept of the seed of the Spirit. And man, I wish we both had more time for this. But let me take you through really quickly and give you a little bit of context for Galatians. So in Galatians, what Paul is addressing is this. He's talking to the Galatian church. And in the church, there was two groups of people. There were those who were the Jewish believers and there were those who were the Gentile believers. And the Jewish believers were saying to the Gentiles, hey, listen, yes, you have to have a relationship with God, but you also have to follow a certain set of rules. You've now got to come in under Jewish law, which meant circumcision. It meant a whole lot of things. And all of a sudden, there was turmoil coming in. Paul hears about this, and he goes nuts. And so he comes in and he begins this treatise in Galatians about how the law can do nothing except point us to what is wrong with what we do. The law could only tell us, hey, here's, here's a set of standards that you're to live by. And if you fall beneath these standards, then guess what? You're out of covenant with God, out of relationship with God. And Paul says, all the law can do is point out how bad you are. Now, let me, let me, let me put this out to you for, think for a second. How many of you have ever been in a relationship? Maybe it's a business relationship. Maybe it's a familial relationship. Uh, whatever the case may be, um, you know, a boss, a coach, where all they did was point out what was wrong with you. Anybody ever experienced that? Right? How does that make you feel? It makes you feel dead inside because you begin to build this expectation that every time I hear from this person, what am I going to hear? How bad I am and what I have to do to correct it. And so we get caught on the hamster wheel of performance, trying to do better and trying to do better for myself to better myself so that I can then be more acceptable. And Paul was saying, you guys are killing them. Because Jesus came and said, yeah, that's the law. And he said, by the way, he said, not that the law had no use, but the law could only point to one thing, what you did wrong. But then it was to be, because of what you did wrong, our dependence on Jesus. Why? Because he recognized that in himself, he couldn't change himself. He says that over in Romans chapter 8. Or Romans chapter 7, he says, man, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I do want to do, I, I, the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing. The things that I do want to do, I don't do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of sin? And then he brings the same concept over in Galatians that Pastor Marco read last week in Galatians 5. And he says, there's this battle between the Spirit of God in me and my old nature, my old way of thinking. But let me put it in context what Paul was talking about. Paul wasn't talking about specifically right here the issue of the battle with pornography, the battle with those. He was saying the battle with your flesh is the battle to be led by the law. You are trying to become slaves to the law, but the law can't bring you life. I am brought you from slavery to sin to slavery to righteousness you're living slavery to the law and I'm bringing you slavery to the spirit which is love okay you follow me so far okay let's step back just a quick second then let's talk about the slavery because that's what I want to get to because it's this mindset Slavery mindset, it's, it's something that controls us. We can become slaves to all kinds of things. Yeah, we can become slaves to addictions. Those can be addictions, right? But, but it's bigger than that. It's, it's the way we begin to think. And, and so let's, let's, we don't like to think of slavery, but let's, let's go to an interesting uh, standard. You see, Paul was not the first one to talk about us becoming slaves. You know who was? Jesus. 
Let's talk about a parable. Matthew chapter 25. One, most all of us, if you've grown up in the church, you've heard it. You probably heard it as a Bible story. You definitely hear it from this pulpit. And it says there's a certain master, and he's going away on vacation. And he calls certain people to him. He gives one ten talents, one five talents, and one one talent. These individuals go, and they take these talents, and they do things with them. The first two individuals take them and they invest them and they grow. The third individual takes them and buries them. And when, Jesus, when the master comes back, he calls the first servant forward. And over in Matthew 25, 21, the, 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 the individual says, okay, here's what I've done. And the master turns to him and says, well done, good and faithful. Could you guys put up the New American Standard version behind me because it says the Lord says unto him well done that's that's American standard not new American standard all right so we'll scrap that one and I'll just tell you what it says the new American standard is one of the only versions that actually does the accurate translation it says well done good and faithful slave let that sit for just a moment the word is doulos in the Greek doulos say with me say doulos doulos what does doulos mean? Slave. And it's interesting because if you go throughout the New Testament and you find so many places where it says servant, if you go to the Greek, it actually says slave. And there's this understanding that there was, uh, there was a fear or there was an uncomfortability that went along with actually saying that. But that is the literal translation. You know why the difference is? What is the difference between a servant and a slave? See, a servant comes along and serves a master for a reward. There's a sense of contractual agreement. I will do my job, and you will reward me for it. But a slave did not have that. He was owned. A slave was under the ownership of a master, and so there was no opinion when it came by and said, here's what you do. The slave didn't go, you know, I really don't think I want to do that. In the negative sense, what happened to a slave that disagreed with his master? Severe punishment. But see, here's the problem. So many of us still look at God like that. So we have this problem. Some of us negotiate with God because we're his servants. And we're going to go, you know, I'll wash the dishes, but I don't do floors. You know, I, I'll, I'll serve the kids uh, as long as you don't ask me to change diapers. Or you know what? I'll definitely, I will serve on the worship team, but please don't have me come in on a Saturday on my 7 o'clock morning and have me clean the building. Why? Because we begin to pick and choose what we do. Why? Because here's the thing. S the servant is going to have this contractual agreement of what they do, and there's an expectation of reward, but the slave comes along and says, I am now at the master's command. All right. I was thinking about this from the perspective because it sounds harsh. We don't want to think like that, but I was thinking about it because Scripture says that we've been freed... We're no longer servants, but we're children. See, no longer slaves, but children. So at what point does that change? And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about, uh, and, 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 and you might react to this, but I was thinking about my kids. What rights do my children have? So my children, when they're infants, are purely in the place where I can care for them, love them, cherish them. But as they begin to get older, they now come under my direction. I begin to tell them what the boundaries will be as part of this family. And if you don't follow those, there becomes what? There becomes discipline. This is not like, hey, Dad, we don't agree with you. It's, they're not servants in my house. In that sense, they're slaves. Some people, please do not take this and say, see, my kids are slaves. They should do whatever. They Wash the dishes, whatever, right? Because that's an earthly mentality. But I'm talking about a father's mentality. Because see, what I'm doing is, when I direct my children, they don't have to understand at an early age why. They just have to do. Why? Because I'm a father who loves my children. I'm going to protect them at all costs and provide for them at all costs. But I also will expect them to do what I say. 
But there comes a point in time when my children begin to grow up and I begin to pass off to them the understandings of the why. And suddenly there becomes less of a need to say, you'll do it because I say to. They'll begin to do it because they understand it. How are they going to understand it? Because they build relationship with me. And then hopefully there comes a point in time when they go off to their own home and the principles that I've taught them become so ingrained in them, they live out of their father's love for the next generation. Why? Because they started as slaves under a man who loves them unconditionally and provides for them and knows what they need. It's my job to hear from God. What is the destiny, God, that you've created them for? And I better be on my knees with my wife saying, God, what have you created my children for? So we get to Galatians. And here's the problem. They are trying to go back to a list of laws. And let's face it, we all want laws. How many have ever said, just tell me how to get it done and I'll do it? Or just tell me what's expected of me and I'll do it, right? And so there's a sense where, okay, it worked out. Okay, you gotta be circumcised. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. And Paul's like, no! No, no, no! You have one thing and one thing only, and that is you are now bound to love, to serve one another as Christ loved you. Here's this interesting statement. Verse 1. I know Pastor Marco wanted to develop this. I was feeling it. For freedom, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again under a yoke of slavery. And how many people have taken a scripture like that and said, we're free to do whatever we want because we're just following the Holy Spirit. We're just being led by the Spirit. We're being led by the Spirit. And in the process, what happens? We break relationships. We go and we begin to say, here's what it looks like to follow the Spirit. And we begin to put rules up and we begin to see, this is how God moves. I'm just going to tell you, the moment you think you know how God moves is when you're wrong. There's a Yiddish, there's a Yiddish principle that says this. It says, man plans his steps and God laughs. But the problem is when we become slaves to our mindset of how God works, we lose the understanding of how God actually works because how he works is he desires to lead us by his spirit. And he says, and this is ultimately what it looks like. Are you ready for this? He says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing it through laws. No. Some people are like, uh, no? What verse is he reading? Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, there's neither circumcision or uncircumcision. They have no value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. He goes on to rebuke him. Who cut in on you? Who made you forget this? He says, let me bring you back and let you put things in order. In verse 13, he says, brothers, and I will say, sisters, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, up oh, here's the word, rather, what's the word you see? The word is doulos. So what does the word doulos mean? So let's read that again. You, my family, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, but rather be slaves to one another in love. For the entirety of the law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. For if you fall short of that, I'm adding the little paraphrase, that would probably be the Amplified Bible. What is the result? If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will also be destroyed by each other. So what do we do? How do we remedy this? We've got to go into this uncomfortable place where we're no longer led by these things we have to do to please God. Now, sometimes those things that we have to do to please God are the right things to do, but not always for the right reasons. I can do something, the right thing for the wrong reason, it's the wrong thing. Unless I'm doing the right thing for the right reason, it does not bear the fruit. Because if, if I go, what, what's the phrase, you know, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. I might say yes to you with my mouth, but inside I'm saying no all the way. 
But a slave doesn't get to have that mentality when they're following Christ. I've been free from this mindset that says, I'm going to tell you how God lives to the place where he says, I want you to tell me how you want me to live. And he says, here's how you live. You live by loving one another as I did. Not from Storge, Eros, or Phileo, where you feel good about these people, so you do good things contractually. That's what a servant does. By the way, the servant, the true servant in the New Testament is called diakonos. Okay, so if you want to find the place where there is a true servant, it's Stephen, right? He was one of the three who was appointed to be those who would care for uh, the, the widows and the orphans and take care of things so the apostles could preach. They were set apart to be servants of the people, diakonos. So there is another word in the New Testament for servant. But in every other place, it's this slave and it's this understanding of saying, what? God, you have freed me from my desires so that I can now live out of yours. But living out of God's desires for me is not easy. Paul would say, guys, I feel your pain. I'm preaching this to you, but I still struggle with it. But I don't set the bar low and go, just do this, 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 and this, and you'll be fine. Because if I just do this, 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 and this, I might be okay, but I don't experience the life. Sports. Never do sports analogies. That's what Pastor Marco tells me. Just don't do it. I think I can get away with this. I'll try. Some of the most amazing speeches ever given have been given in locker rooms by coaches. So a coach says to his team, okay, here's what we're going to do. If you guys want to be the best, you got to be up 4.30 every morning. you got to run five miles. After you run five miles, you're going to do 300 push-ups. Then we're going to do all these whatever moves they do, football players do. It's been too long. You know what they are. That's where the sports breaks down on me. (laughs) But if you do that, we're going to be the best team. Right? And so now the team is out there, right? But there's another coach. And the coach says, guys, this is how the game is won. You've got to see the goal in mind. You've got to know. We are, we are called. We are going to be the best team out there. You've got to know that it's going to take everything within you. It's going, to take, it's going to take your heart. It's going to take your soul. You're going to have to give everything you've got. But if we do that, we will be one team and we will succeed. So if you have the team that's just got the list of rules, they're going to do that. But you know what happens? All of a sudden, the team members begin to evaluate each other. Are you following the rules? Are you doing it the way I'm doing it? And what begins to happen? They begin to compare themselves to one another. What happens to that team? They fall apart. Why? Because they're constantly comparing themselves to each other's performance. But the coach that sets the vision before him is in charge. He calls the plays. He says, here's how I know we're going to win. But he says, I need more from you than just following rules. I need your heart. And we have a God that desires our hearts, but we still keep trying to follow laws. And Paul says only laws can do is bring death and failure. God is calling this congregation to a higher standard. He's saying it is no longer good enough to stay at home and love me because you can't love me without loving one another. And by the way, loving one another isn't just doing good things for each other because it's the right thing to do. It's saying I'm willing to get down there in the children's ministry because I have a responsibility to the next generation. It says, I'm going to give, honey, baby, I love you. You're right on with your message. I give not just because it's the right thing to do. It's because I have an understanding that I love God with all of my heart. I'm giving him everything I have. Not, by the way, contractually that he's going to fix everything, but because I trust him. Here's the other thing, right? We still do things and we give things to God because we expect that God will do things good for us. But Romans 8.28, Paul says, and my God will make all things work together. Oh, I heard some people say it wrong, and I heard some people say it right. Thank you. My God will make all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. You take that the out, and it changes the verse altogether. Because now it comes across and says, my God will make everything smiley and ducky if you love me. And that's not what he's saying. 
He's saying he will take the hard moments of your life and he will work him for his purposes in your life, not your purposes in your life, because you're not a servant, you're a slave. But when you're a slave to the master, he provides for you. And as you grow, he trusts you with more and more and more. And by the way, you know how it's true? It comes out in the way you serve one another. My encouragement for you today as I close is this. Are you a servant of God? Will you do things for him with the expectation that he does things back for you? Are you a slave to God that says, God, I will love you unconditionally and demonstrate that by the way I love those around me? Because Paul over there in Romans chapter 6 says this. When you live the other way around... What good did you get out of it? Did you feel better? Were you happier? No. Because slaves to self only brings death. But slaves to Christ brings life. It will not always be easy, but it will always be guaranteed. But as Moses said to the people, choose you this day whom you will be a slave to. Can you receive that? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, search our hearts even in this moment right now. God, I'm asking you would even show us the internal rules we've lived by that have alienated us from one another and in the process, Lord, alienated us from you. Father, forgive us for still trying to control you, control you, manipulate you by doing good things, but not doing them truly for you, but Lord, for our own sake. God, we want to live pure hearted before you. Maybe you are watching online right now, or maybe you're even sitting in this room. And all of this seems to have gone over your head a little bit because you're like, whoa, what the heck? Here's what we know. Paul talks about slaves to unrighteousness. It's the recognition that there are, there's sin in my life. Sin is anything that separates us from God. And by the way, sin thus re- separates us from one another. Some people are so hungry. They're looking for hope. They're looking for life. They're looking for meaning. You will not find it apart from saying, Jesus, I give you my whole life, whatever it means. And just like my little children, they don't know everything it means right off, but they know this. The Father loves them. And if you're watching online and you're struggling with that sense of meaning, I don't care, you might be the wealthiest person out there. Everything may look beautiful on the outside. I'm not talking about people who are just depressed. It's, there's something not right when I tell you Jesus is the answer it is but he's not something you try you don't try Jesus like you try clothes on the only way is to say Jesus by faith I believe in you and I'm going to follow you when you do that here's the promise that I know he begins to change your life Sometimes all of a sudden smooth, rocky places become smooth. Other times smooth parts become rocky, but suddenly you realize even in the rocky moments you're not alone. But by the way, you still need to be connected to others because God has called us to be his hands and feet, his words of love. That's why you can't just sit at home and watch online. You've got to be connected to his body that you can hear Jesus' love through the voices of those who can surround you. But today is a decision day. Number one, if you've never asked Jesus to be the master of your life, today's your day. But then for the rest of us, it's your day to evaluate. Am I living by laws or am I living by love? If I'm living by love, is it the love that gives unconditionally or is it have an expectation of return? If you have an expectation of return, then turn your heart back to God 
and let him give you the courage to love unconditionally. Can you receive that word tonight? Would you stand to your feet as we close? If today is your day to say, Jesus, I want you in charge of my life, I want to invite you to come down here. Now, here's the deal. We don't always do it this way, but it is one of those moments of saying, you know what? I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Servant kind of decides whether it's good or not, but one who says, God, I'm ready to have you as a master, says, I'm, I'm ready. I'm all in whatever it takes. If that's you today, you're ready to say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to go all in. I'm ready to come down. You may have been sitting in this church for 15 years. You may be serving in an area of ministry. I don't care. If today's the day you realize you followed law, not love, you followed yourself and not Christ, I invite you to come down to this altar. We'll pray with you right now. I'm going to close this in prayer. And as I'm closing in prayer, just make your way right on down. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. God, I thank you because you said you would give us your Holy Spirit all to workers if you'd come to the front. I, I, we, I thank you that, Lord, we give, when we give you ourselves, you give us all of you. When we give all of us, you give us all of you. Father, you said that the mind controlled by the Spirit is full of life and it's full of love. God, we desire to have minds controlled by you. Jesus, we give you our lives not just to try you out, but forever. But now, Lord, we commit to loving those around us the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen.